a very, very warm welcome to you, Jamie Dixon, to thank you interview this morning. Thank you for taking the time. We're going to kick straight off. I'm really curious to hear about your writing exploits. I've heard it from a from a secret source that it's quite a good story. The, I don't uh, know if you know who that is or not, but the um, uh, secret magic source. <laughs> wow, well, yeah, good, good, uh, well worked out. So yeah, question number one: Why, why did you write a book? How did it come about? Um, well, yeah, good question. It's, and it's a, a, bit, a bit of a complicated story with uh, a, a, with many little stories inside. But I, I think there's one story in particular that I think our mutual friend Yuri was getting to. But um, to go back about 10 years ago, I, mm. I finished a master's degree. And uh, part of that master's degree was writing a dissertation. And I discovered, strangely, that I really enjoyed researching and writing um, okay. that dissertation. And so as soon as I finished that, I decided I wanted to continue researching and continue writing, but do what I was interested in. And at the time, I was very interested in um, training design and facilitation. I, was, I work as a leadership development coach and trainer, and I was based in China, and I was yeah. working with a lot of international training companies, trying to run their training programs in China, and cultural differences caused a lot of challenges. So that just sparked a lot of curiosity for me. So I just continued researching into that area, and, you know, Long story short there, after six years, I wrote my, well, I published my first book, which is about how to design and deliver practical training. And I didn't have any particular strategy in mind. I was just following my interest, following my curiosity. I went round about lots of times, wrote down lots of essays, deleted loads of stuff, came up with a framework, that shit, and then deleted that. And then after six years, I was like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. I better just get this done. And um, and I pushed myself, I, I kind of drew a line in the sand and I just got that out, uh, got that out there. And um, I, I, I think uh, that first experience of writing a book, because I've noticed a lot of other creators I know around me who are writing books. Um, I think that first book is the biggest challenge when it comes to yeah. writing, because you've got to overcome perfectionism, uh, That's exactly find... what my question was going to be. Are you a perfectionist? Well, I I have been. And yeah. um, my second book, which is the one I think Yuri was pointing to, taught me to let go of perfectionism. And so my, my second book, uh, I, it started with a conversation with Yuri where I was already working on the third book and I'd been doing research for that book. And I, I completed the research in a year. And I, yeah. I messaged Yuri and I said, so my first book took me four years to research. And this one, I've completed the research in one year. So I've, I've, got, I've got faster. And Yuri said, why don't you write another book about the lessons you've learned about speeding up your process? <laughs> and I, 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 really, I really love Yuri. Uh, he's a very good friend of mine, a good mentor of mine. And he's the kind of person I, I want to impress as well because um, yeah. I, I really respect him. So I said, how about this, Yuri? I will write, edit, and publish a book in 24 hours. And, um, and he said, let's do it. And you know, we started this whole movement called 24 Let's Go, uh, where a bunch of people would get together on Zoom, and we'd all just um, tell each other what we're going to do over the next 24 hours and then just do it. And my task was to write, edit, and publish a book. So I locked myself in a hotel room for you know, 24 hours, and, um, and I did it. <laughs> and um, the book is called Overcome and Get It Done, uh, and it's about productivity principles, um, uh, you know, how to do things faster, how to be more disciplined. This was this and was the one you'd researched. No, actually. So oh, so the, you were starting from point zero. Yeah, I, I, the one I'd researched. I'll get to that one in a little bit. Um, but oh, I kind of okay. I kind of shelved that for a little while. And um, so for this one, this this was not really something I'd researched at all. It was more just based on my own experience of, you know, getting better at things and productivity. And I'd already delivered a lot of productivity workshops and stuff. So I already had a lot right. of ideas. But but the, um, the, the kind of the story that I had in mind, which really gave me the belief that I could do that was, you know how when you're at university and you get given a dissertation to write, and yeah. in theory, you have like a year to write that dissertation. 
But what happens in reality so, is... This Parkinson's law you're going to talk about. It, kind of. What happens in yeah, reality yeah. is you, you wait and then you wake up one morning and go, oh, shit, I have 24 hours to write it. Yeah, and I noticed yeah. when I was at university, so many people did that. And they were able to write it in 24 hours. And I thought if a bunch of lazy slacker students can write a, a, a dissertation, a 10,000 word dissertation in 24 hours, then um, uh, surely I can do the same as well. Um, and I, I kind of chunked it down into like, I think it was 700 word sections and um, just locked myself away in the hotel room, wrote one section after another section after another section. Each section was one thought like a principle about productivity and I'd share an example from my own life or some other thoughts and I'd narrow it down to 700 words. And once I was at 700 words, boom, I was, uh, I was done with that section. And yeah, the whole book in total took me 15 hours to write. I had someone editing it in the background. I had a designer designing the cover in the background. And during my breaks, I'd be sharing on social media, which cover do you guys like? And, I'd share the updates with my editor and then I was able to get it done just on the deadline and it was it I uploaded it and it was even available for purchase 24 hours after I started it which was amazing um that was a really big confidence booster that I think Do you know what there's there's a lot of takeaways I'm not 100% sure where to start but I think what is really important is the point you made about what you can achieve in a certain amount of time mm. and you know, whether that is writing a book or whether it's even just writing a blog post or making a YouTube video or recording an audio thing. I think we, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone, right? I'm not sitting on my high horse, not berating anyone, but we do seem to trivialize almost how tough stuff is or the challenges that we can do, we can't achieve maybe. Hmm. Like, I, I, I think for me, um, when I wrote that, that second book, I realized that um, it's, there are different ways of approaching this stuff. Like, yeah. the first book and, and the third book, I really wanted to research out a framework. And that research process and the refinement process, that really does take years. And so if yeah. you're looking for a particular framework, a methodology, or whatever that takes a lot of work but with that second book that i did in just 24 hours there was no particular framework it was just a, a kind of stream of consciousness a list of different principles yeah and um i found people actually really liked it i think because it was I, short i was and, gonna ask that are you proud of it yeah <laughs> i'm very very proud of it actually okay. um I, and i i'm proud of um not so much the, as, in, as the, in the content as opposed to actually the achievement, I guess. I'm more proud of the achievement. The content, yeah. I don't think, you know, I don't think is anything particularly special. But this is also something I learned about getting these books out there is yeah. everyone, everyone gets something different from it. And I found a lot of people have really taken a lot of value from that book, even yeah. just reading through principles that are put very plainly um and they might be common sense principles like you know you have to sacrifice i think was one of the chapters i wrote if you if you want to be focused you have to sacrifice and yeah. you know that's something that's common sense but to put it quite plainly um and and i've, I've had a few few, few people comment about that they, they found that valuable but i think as well just the fact that i can tell a story about i wrote a book in 24 hours um that I, I think that is something that a lot of people take a lot of value from. And so yeah. that, that, that I, I'd say I'm, I'm very proud of. No, it's very, very, is it still, is it still available now? Yeah, it's still available now. Yeah. It's, um, it's on Amazon oh, called so share, Overcome. Share the link. It is, that, is it in Amazon? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Overcome okay. and get it done. Yeah. Overcome. Get it done. I'll share that below in the show notes. I think it's really, do you know what it, it's kind of weird we're having this podcast today because my my week this week is a series a series of challenges that I've put off and put off and put off but actually each and every one of them is probably a a small amount of hours focused work mm. 
that to exactly to your point earlier is like oh, I'll get around to it I'll get around to it and it just never happens mm. but actually I, I set aside this week to do them so you're quite quite the inspiration would you, would you do it again <laughs> I, I in fact I would um, and I'm thinking about that because I so like with my third book and and my third book is called the story habit and it's all about storytelling and that is where I'm now starting to niche down into and focus all of my business on. Um, the previous two books, I was just kind of following, you know, following the wind and just doing things for fun. But the story yeah. habit is more about business. And I've done the well-researched book with the methodology, the framework and the tools, which took a lot of time to create. But now I'm thinking about making a series of shorter um how to books which i could easily do in in 24 hours again well this is this is what i was going to ask because a lot of books i feel like are i guess for lack of a better term bloated or Mm. could be pdfs or could be a blog post but i guess i don't know publishers get involved and they say we want them to be this amount of words or whatever whatever and as a Mm. result they get added on like you know sort of lego pieces and I guess you're at the other end of the spectrum where it's like, right, I'm going to get this done. I was going to ask you, like, has, because doing that 24 hour book, has that led to your third book, the approach you've taken? Has it, has it changed as a result? And I guess that's kind of what you said, right? I, it, I think it, it influenced it a little bit. So one thing I really wanted to do in that book was make things very accessible whilst at the same time also having the, um, you know, the, the bulk uh, of examples, case studies to really bring the ideas to life. But I yeah. wanted to write a book that people could go into and either they could read it from start to end they or they could jump in and out um, and find the bits that were most relevant to them. Or if they wanted, yeah. they could just flip to the summary section at the end and um, read through that in 30 seconds or if they wanted to they could find the summary section of of the whole book at the end and read through that in three minutes so i really wanted to make it as accessible as possible and i think where that 24-hour book is going to have the most influence on on my work going forward is when i i sit down to write the shorter how-to books um because i already have the ideas in my mind they're already well researched and well refined and I don't need to do that research anymore. And um, I know through the workshops I've been doing, what questions people have been asking me, what people have found useful. And so yeah. all it would take is just sit down and get that out into a piece of paper. And I know as well from experience with that 24 hour book that uh, people like short books and they finish short books as well. Yeah. And, and short books, I think, sell really, really well. I, I had something like 500 downloads in the week, uh, just the weekend that I launched that book, uh, which was crazy. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of value to that. No, I think there is. And I, it's funny you say that. I'm currently reading um, I don't, the Robert Galbraith book. And, and I've read... Uh, all the books up to this point. I think it's four or five, I can't remember. And I've got it on my Kindle, so I can't quite tell you that you you don't have that visual uh, sign of how Mm. far through the book you are. But I know I'm on page like 800. Wow. (laughs) That's a big book. It is. It's a huge book. But it's getting to the point now where I'm like, I mean, as we spoke previously before we started recording, like we both got young kids. (laughs) And I don't know if, like, I used to read a lot. So I no longer commute and I've now got two kids. So my reading time is just, like, evaporated. Mm. And, it, and it's like, oh, well, you know, maybe I'll squeeze in a quick five, ten minutes before I go to sleep at night. Which means trying to read an 800-page book. Or no, actually, it's, it's, I don't even know how many pages it is. It's currently 800 pages or something. Like, this book is taking me bloody ages. Mm. And it's enjoyable. And this isn't a criticism of the book at all. It's just, I'm like, I'm starting to get to the point now where I'm a bit bored of reading it. And I'm not, I'm bored of the story, I'm bored of reading it. Yeah. 
And yeah. actually, I I don't want to say oh we're in this we're in this um, time of like you know short form and no one's got an attention span anymore and it's all about TikTok and all that, but there is a lot to be said for condensing information into a shorter time frame. Hmm. I I agree, and I um you know because I I'm I focus on nonfiction in my in my yeah. books, and they're all things about how to do things, and I think. With that kind of category of book, um, if you really want people to do things, you need to just let them go off and do things as yeah, opposed yeah. to just tell them over and over and over. Uh, I think there is actually a bigger market for what I would call, and apologize for using a naughty word, but I would call intellectual masturbation books, which is uh, <laughs> the, the kind of pseudoscience um oh i have something i can bring up at a dinner party to make you sound clever kind of yeah. book uh, yeah, yeah. I, I honestly think there's a massive market for those kinds of books but um i, I i'm a lot more interested in, in the kind of books where people can kind of read and take away and, and, and go and do things and i think for yeah. that kind of book um the shorter the better however hundred hundred percent agree yeah. However, I'm not entirely sure if there's such a big market for that. I um, I mean, there is a market for it, but I I believe it's smaller than the uh, the intellectual masturbation market. It, it might be, but I think I think I tell us a good example of this is the do the do le, the do books. Have you ever seen any of those? The do books. So the do book company is a series of books where they have guest authors come in and talk about different philosophies different theories different ideas but they're all very short and they're, they're very they're um illustrated very nicely they're very succinct and most of them you could probably read <coughs> you know in a, a solid reading session or two but the, I, I can't I mean, i've got quite a collection of them now but they're just very going back to your point earlier you, I feel like a lot of books just are totally overwritten almost. And I think to, if I, if I want to learn about a certain thing, whether it's storytelling, whether it's, you know, a niche bit of marketing or, you know, creating X, Y, Z, I don't need, the analogy I'd say is like, if you've seen these recipes online, you know, when you go and you say, Oh, you want to cook something and you look, Google it and it comes back with, Oh, you know, and the, the, the person who's sharing the recipe shares their whole life story and how, you know, Grandpa Joe did this thing back in 1984 and actually reminds them. It's like, I don't care. I just want the recipe. I just want to be shown how to do it, what I need to do it. And then I want you to sort of, I don't know, hold my hand through doing it. Right. And I think a lot of books don't do that. It drives me crazy. Mm. Yeah. It, it drives me nuts as well. Um, they have this idea, this one idea and, um, it's like the publisher wants to make it a marketable book. So yeah. pump it full of case studies. Here's Must another be 700 case study. pages. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I don't like that either. And I, I see that in some thought leaders online as well. Like even some of the biggest thought leaders, they just say stuff that sounds really profound, but is really just confirming what a lot of people believe already and that's the yeah. only reason they they um they're, they're so successful they're just confirming people's beliefs and I, I i think it's that again it's like i was saying about that market for intellectual masturbation i yeah. i do notice this working in leadership development as well um there are people who genuinely want to learn and improve but then there's also a lot of people who just they're just there for the the aha moments and and that's that's what development and growth and learning is to them um, yeah. and yeah <laughs> I, I think the real people the, the people who really want to change i think they're a much smaller market do you know the, i think the best example of this is atomic habits by james clear mm. and i think it's a powerful book and a powerful powerful concept but i genuinely believe it could have been 10 pages Mm. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure it could have been. Yeah. It, it, if it's such a simple idea. And, you know, 
if I give the example of my my own book, the story habit, like mm. now that I've written that book and it's forty thousand words, which is right. a medium sized book, it's only now that I've written that book that I could probably turn it into a ten page book, and yeah, uh, maybe. And, and, and it's the process of getting to that um, that framework and then yeah. bringing the framework to life and then realizing what is essential to bring this framework to life. And, you know, that part that I liked, actually, I could drop that. I would actually like to go back at some point and rewrite the story habit and make it a, a bit smaller. But I feel I've had to do this first version in order to right. to be able to do that. Um, and I, I guess with James Clear's book, because James Clear's book is, is one of the most successful books, I I, I think, because um, I just see it number one in so many yeah. charts. Um, and I guess if he were to do that, he'd probably make a lot less money. <laughs> well, His publisher wouldn't be happy. No, so I mean, this, maybe we should start a company called the 10 Page Book Company and actually just <laughs> yeah. get people. I mean, it depends what the model is, right? And this And this is... It's, it's funny. I mean, maybe there's something in that, but maybe the model is right. Okay, I want to learn about this stuff, but I don't want to. I mean, look at it in real terms, right? Say you buy, say there's a, a James Clear size book for everything you want to learn about. You're not going to mm. learn about everything for the next five years, right? It's, it's that thing. So whereas <clears throat> maybe there's a middle ground between that and the blog post, and there's something in the middle where maybe someone I don't know, whether it's subscription well, based or not, I don't know, but. In in um in the field of, of learning and development and leadership development, which is the field I come from, there's a lot of talk these days about how how training is a waste of time because people go on these training courses, they get these aha moments, these ideas, and they go back and they don't change anything. Right. And some people, and this is actually something, an idea I also concluded myself when I wrote my first book, and I'm now seeing a lot of experts talking about this now, um, have realized that if you want people to change their behavior, you give them a tool to take away or a resource to take away and follow. And as, as okay. an example, there's a, a famous book called The Checklist Manifesto, which is about, um, you know, one example is how surgeons, in order to avoid infecting patients when they were sealing up wounds, um, you give them a simple checklist of do this first, do this first, and they do all of the correct steps and they it reduced infections by a significant rate. And okay. what that was, was a resource, a tool that people follow to get particular results. And I, I, I think of books as having the potential to do that as well. And if they were a 10 page book or even better, a one page book, or simply yeah. a resource, a tool that people can follow to do stuff, then that is actually something that changes people's behavior and, and gets results um, with yeah. a minimum investment of, of time and effort. So I think there's um, I, I think there's some potential to that idea, actually, <laughs> just making a, a big database of resources for particular people trying to do particular things rather than wasting their time flipping through all of these pages. Yeah. I mean, just to pull at that thread a bit, do you think when when people go for these trainings and then take them back into their workplaces, do you think that's kind of the issue, that once they're back in the workplace, they just, some workplaces are like open to stuff and really, you know, adventurous and ambitious and, and the rest of it, but then some are just like, oh, you know, come away all inspired, and then you get back into work and it's just like, oh, no one's really interested or like, you get, you're beaten down again straight away. I, I think that's that is definitely a huge part of it um, because mm. you've got this inertia and it could be resistance from the person themselves. You know, yeah. they don't care. They don't want to change. Or it could just be they don't have the opportunity to apply what they learned or it could be um, no one else is doing it. So why should I do it? Or yeah. it could be my manager doesn't expect me to do it and they're not giving me any praise. So what the hell? Um, there's a whole load of reasons, which speaks to, and, and like this, this has been a big focus of mine throughout my career, behavior change, because right. leadership development, learning development is about behavior change. My first book, How to Design and Deliver Practical Training, was about behavior change. 
Overcome and Get It Done, my second book is also about you know, changing your own behavior. And the story habit is also about shaping people's behaviors through the stories you tell. So I'm yeah. obsessed with behavior change. And there are so many um, things that go against changing people's behavior that the only really practical solution is to give someone something very, very easy to do. Very, very simple. Yeah. With minimal effort, minimal resistance, and just do this and boom. Um, uh, so I, I, I think there's something, there's something there. <laughs> uh, definitely a lot of potential and opportunity in that area, I think. Let me, let me ask you a quick question. When people ask, when people say to you, oh, Jamie, what do you do? What, what's your general answer? <laughs> I, I, I've really struggled with this. It's, um, I really have struggled with this. And if you ask me at a different time, I give a different answer. For the last few months, because I've only just returned to the UK, um, I've been telling people I work in leadership development. Um, previously, I would tell people, oh, I'm a corporate trainer or I'm a training designer or uh, I help people influence behavior. Uh, but I, I found it very, very difficult to describe. Not, not, once, not once have you said author in that, in that little ramble. No, um, I, I wouldn't call myself an author. Um, I'd love to make a living out of making books, uh, but I don't think that's very realistic, to be honest. Um, okay. I just have so many interests in so many different things that I enjoy doing. I, I have recently made a strategic decision to just focus on storytelling in my work and training okay. people, coaching people, consulting on storytelling. Um, and, and that is what I am going to tell people I do going forward. Uh, okay. but yeah, it, I found that the hardest question to answer because I have so many different interests. <laughs> no, I, I hear you, man. I hear you. Um, in the interest of not taking up your whole day with this, the, let's talk about, I'm curious about your, so for anyone who wants the, the point of this podcast, I'd, I'd love people to listen to it and, and go, Oh, I hear what Jamie's done. And I kind of want to emulate or uh, replicate or something so tell me about your brainstorming and ideation process and i guess that could be i mean i've never written a book so i guess that could be from like the seed of i want this book to be about this or maybe it's a little bit further down the line i don't know i'll, I'll leave it to you so it generally starts with questions that i have um and then i go off and i research answers and so when I started writing my first book, um, that was because I had had a lot of feedback from Chinese people about the trainings that I was delivering for these international training companies saying that it's not practical and um, we want it practical. And so the question I had was, how do you make things practical? And it, it took me years to find an answer for that. But just that question took me to lots of different sources. Right. And, and with the storytelling book, it started with the question of, well, first of all, it started with the question of why are people so obsessed with storytelling? Um, yeah. Because I, I kept getting requests from HR managers for storytelling training for a group of engineers. And I was like, why, why would you want storytelling for them? And they said, well, when they give their reports, um, their reports are really boring and send people to sleep. And then <laughs> I think, well, why not just make the report simpler? Why turn it into this really complex yeah. narrative with a, uh, a Again, game of thrones? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I realized that actually they're just trying to make things more meaningful. And, yeah. and that really got me very curious. And that led me down a whole load of rabbit holes. And so that, that was the question that started the research for the story habit. And so my, my, my process is to start with these questions and then go read, 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 read uh, until I start okay. to get some ideas. And that's probably leads to more questions and then more yeah. ideas. And as I get ideas, I write the ideas down into essays. So what I was doing for my, um, my research year when I was writing the story habit was I would, at the end of each week for all of the research I'd done, I'd just write an essay about some of the ideas I'd had. And um, I was posting it on a blog and I had um, I had a few dozen people following this blog. And so every time I published a new post, 
um, that would get sent to them. And then some of them would send me feedback. Some of them would say, Jamie, that was way too academic. Um, and another person <laughs> once, once sent me a comment that I sent that to my father and he said, oh, this is so true. And, and so that kind of told me, okay, that this is, this is a keeper and this is not a yeah, keeper. Yeah. And um, I, I'm also in a fortunate position of being able to deliver workshops. And I find workshops are a really great place to test ideas. So the ideas I'd come up with through my research process, I'd then test them in workshops and some would fall flat on their face. Some, <laughs> some, some I say most would fall flat on their face, but then like some real time skip. market research. Yeah, exactly. And they're like, Oh, yeah. crap, I'm, I'm not doing that again. And um, like one, one thing that uh, like one example, just a framework from the story habit um, actually came quite late into the writing process. It was one random framework that I came up with for um, helping people figure out how to influence or persuade others. And it's called Relate, Challenge, Resolve. And first you start by relating that to them, then you can challenge yeah. them, and then you resolve whatever's in the way of them getting to action. And um, I came up with that idea just through a random brainstorming process when I was trying to group a whole bunch of similar ideas together into different categories. I thought, oh, Relate, Challenge, Resolve. I tested it in a workshop and uh, people just got it. And it, it yeah. um, I obviously I explained it with a few other things and, um, I, and they were able to use it to solve a problem as well. And then I realized that actually that's the structure of a story. Story always starts by relating to the audience before, before yeah. presenting a challenge and then resolving the challenge. And I tried it again, um, same framework, but for telling stories. And people got it. Um, and I, I shared it with a few friends. And um, one of them, in fact, I think you know him, David Pullen, uh, he told me, yeah. yeah, he told me that's gold. And so, okay, I, I think I've got something with this framework. So it was, um, my, my process is a series of carefully crafted accidents, I would say. Nice. <laughs> and, and, um, and that's where all these ideas come from. Okay. So once you have your ideas, what sort of systems and processes do you have in place to take them from that idea stage to go, right, okay, to the finished article, I guess? Well, for my business in particular, um, it's about being able to run workshops around these ideas. And okay. for my, um, and because of my first book about how to design and deliver practical training, the methodology I came up with to design practical training was to design around tools, which you know, I was talking about earlier with regards to behavior change. So my yeah. approach is to summarize these ideas into a tool. And the tool could be a checklist, a template, a framework, a process, or whatever. Once right. I've got a tool, I can then build a workshop around the tool. Um, and so get the idea, validate the idea, turn the idea into the tool, um, yep. test out the tool, see if I can use the tool on my own to solve a problem first, test out the, the tool in a workshop and see if it works for the, for other people, and then um, start to build a whole workshop around it. And sometimes I'll do like pro bono uh, short workshops, like 60 minutes, I reach out to people and say, would you know a team be interested in this workshop? And I run it and that goes well. Okay. And, and actually, yeah. I have found that by that point, because the idea is validated, the tool is validated, and I know how to, I have a lot of experience with designing workshops, I find by that point, um, it goes very well. I don't really get anyone, um, any disasters when running the pro bono workshops. Um, uh, but still best to do it just to be safe. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of grows from there. So those pro bono ones, are you basically you testing out a workshop you've got in mind to see if it lands with the audience and then yeah. once you've got that i guess it essentially becomes then becomes a case study a bit of social proof to then roll out commercially yeah and um like so for the workshops i do i'm now focusing in on doing um three hour workshops uh which can also be condensed into like a 60 to 90 minute webinar and the okay. difference is that with the workshop, there's a lot more interaction, there's group discussions, group activities with the webinar. It's just, I ask them questions, they post answers in chat. 
And right. that then allows me to run the webinars as a promotional activity. I've got something that's tested, it's validated, it's mine. I know it's going to work um, and yep. I can do it in 60 minutes. And so that was what I was doing just before I moved to the UK. And um, that was starting to generate a bit of momentum for my business. I had to pause it since I've moved back, but I'll be getting back into that soon. But yeah. um, having that as a promotional activity, I can run the webinar, I can record the webinar. And it's not one of those really sleazy upsell <laughs> webinars where which all follow the same form there. It's just, here's my great idea, enjoy it. And you know, if people like it, then afterwards they, um, they contact me and we have a, a further discussion. Then there's lots of stuff I, I can do with, with those tools and the workshops um, going forward. And they, they become a core part of my business. So you, you kind of segued nicely onto the next question then, I think. So it's about goals with your content. I guess I'll throw webinars in there uh, and your books. So, and you, you, you said earlier that you don't really consider yourself an author. So would I be correct in assuming that the goal with all this content you're creating, whether it's webinars or whether it's books or, or whatever, it's all a, a, a lead gen activity towards your, towards your business? I would say it's trying to be an ecosystem um, of things that include lead generation activities, but also products that I sell in multiple formats. So, um, for example, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I'm about to go all in on the story habit. Um, yeah, because I've, I've had a lot of validation for that. And I'm very interested in it. I think I have a lot to offer to my to my clients in that area. So okay. my business going forward is the story habit. And the story habit is is based around maybe half a dozen three hour workshops, uh, each of which can be a webinar. And okay. every time I run a promotional webinar, I can record that. So now I have a little database of free webinars. If people want to watch those, um, sign up for my mailing list. I also have free tools um, from the book. Uh, and um, so people who read the book, if they want to download the tools, they can download and get on my mailing list. And yeah. I also have a lot of content that I can record around those ideas. Um, and then, uh, so for, for like YouTube, for example. Um, and then another side to the, to the business is online courses. I published a few online courses on Udemy and I'm starting yeah. to uh, get m more and more success on Udemy now. I have a lot of a lot more faith in Udemy going forward and um, I'm going to be investing a bit more time into Udemy going forward. Okay. Um, and we'll also be selling the online courses on my own platform as well. So just having these ideas validated, productized, there's, there's so many different things I can do with the same idea. Uh, yeah. webinars, workshops, coaching, um, books, online courses, promotional videos. Uh, there's just so much, <laughs> so much that can so, be done. So when you came up with the idea of writing the story habit, did you have this whole thought ecosystem thought process in your head already? I would say that was, um, that was a goal. Um, I, yeah, yeah I'd had this dream of, um, building this ecosystem uh, and I had I ha so someone who really inspired me and you might want to get him on your podcast as well his name is Jimbo Clark and he has this this thing called the box so he's a he's a facilitator like night like me he runs a lot of workshops and his workshop is um, the box and it's all about okay. um, you know how we say uh, think outside of the box he, yeah. His motto was, well, no one's told us what the box is. So we yeah. have to clarify what the box is before we can think outside of the box. Uh, and so he has this physical box that he puts on people's heads. And first of all, he gets them to draw pictures on the outside of this is who I am, who I show myself to the world to be. And then on the inside, these are my filters, my pressures, my goals, et cetera, et cetera. And okay. so he's, he's made a business out of selling this box. And... Um, <laughs> And it's a great business model because uh, you go on his website and you just see pictures of people with boxes on their heads. And so it's yeah. got this really good visual component to it. And he's licensed it to probably hundreds of facilitators right now. 
and it's a wow, great business brilliant. model. And so that that was something I really wanted. He was a big inspiration for me when I started writing the story Habit. And I really wanted to build something that could turn into something like the box. Um, I don't think I have the box because I don't have the, the physical tangible thing. So I had to change yeah. slightly, but I have a methodology and, and <clears throat> lots of products I can build around it now. I definitely wanted something I could build a business around. And the ecosystem is an idea that I think has also evolved over time because I've realized that um, I've had a lot of different interests, you know, training, design, leadership development, coaching, behavior design, productivity, all sorts of stuff. And if they don't tie together nicely, you can't really build an ecosystem around it. No. But if everything ties together nicely, it's very easy to turn this into a workshop, a webinar, a book, an online course, and really milk it for all it's worth. Um, and so I'd say the, the idea of an ecosystem, I kind of had a, a feeling of that when I started, but the clarity of it really evolved over time. And I guess the good thing about that ecosystem is people can find their way to it via all the different flags you planted, right? Whether or not it's the book or whether or not it's someone going home and telling their husband or wife about this crazy workshop they did where they put boxes on heads or, you know, even just a blog post or LinkedIn or wherever, right? And I think that's, it's kind of something I think a lot of content creators don't necessarily think of or know how to get the best out of. And I, and I consider myself the same, actually. A lot of what you're saying here is you're sparking a lot of thoughts in my head about something that I'm working on at the moment, which I might pick your brains out off air. But I think it's uh, it's kind of why I love doing this podcast, because I you never really know where anyone's going to go with the, with the information. Mm. And the value that some people share. I think what you you may not know what you've shared as to be so valuable but i think what you just said was really important because the ecosystem angle is something that's often overlooked i think and one thing i found is you know i i think a lot of people a lot of creators can probably relate to this you build a following on linkedin or youtube and yep. you're like yeah i have like seven thousand followers or whatever so surely that's going to translate into business but yeah it, it doesn't because, um, well, you know, for some people it does, sometimes it does, but most of those people are not going to be your clients if you're only selling um, expensive things to big corporations, which is what mm. I, I have been doing in the past. But now that I have a book and an online course, um, I have people paying for my things who previously wouldn't have. And obviously, yeah. I'm not going to make the same amount of money from them as a corporate uh, would give me. But I now have an expanded customer base and I have more things that I can offer. Well, the, to bar them. the barrier of entry has changed dramatically, hasn't it? Yeah. And I, I can work mm. with a greater, greater variety of people, which, um, to be honest, I enjoy. Uh, I, I don't think, you know, niching is, uh, is something I felt the pressure to do. But I don't think niching means you have to narrow yourself down to one particular target market. I think yeah. if you do want to target a particular market, you do need a particular way of approaching it, but you can have one particular way for this target market, one particular way for this target market, and one particular way for this target market. Yeah. And variety is the spice of life. Um, yeah, so it mm. opens up a lot more opportunities. Indeed. Um, let's talk about feedback. And you kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier. Is it something you actively look for when you're, I'll, I'll, I'll make it wider. I mean, obviously it's going to be more about your book, but I guess in general, feedback sounds like it's important. You said about the pro bono workshops and you said about, you know, throwing things out there and, and ideas. Yeah. It says to me that obviously feedback is an important thing for you. Uh, absolutely. And I would say that um, one of the most valuable business lessons I've learned and I'm I would not consider myself a successful business person but one of the most valuable business lessons I've learned is your business is always going to be at least 50% defined by the customer and uh, something I've done myself in the past and I think every entrepreneur or wannabe entrepreneur does at some point is 
just think about what you want it to be. And the reality yeah. is uh, it also has to be what your customers want it to be. And so you can have this great idea, but if no one buys it, well, it's not a business. And if yeah. no one buys it, it also means only you think it's a great idea. So yeah. it has to be tested in order to be to be a bit a business. Um, so the feedback is really important. And um, for me, the feedback is just about, does my stuff work? Um, not so much do people like it, but does it work? Yeah. Uh, and do I get invited to do things for customers? <laughs> I'd say those two things are the most important things. Some people yeah. have their opinions. And, you know, I, I, I've had a few comments about, about my work before uh, from some friends as well. And fair enough. But um, I've had people say it works for them and I've had clients invite me to do stuff for them. So for me, that's that's the kind of feedback that, that matters the most. Yeah. No, makes a lot of sense. How do you um, how do you get your stuff? And again, this was originally about the book, but I will widen it out a little bit. But how do you get your stuff to stand out from the crowd? And, and I, I'll add a little bit more to that. I think you see so many people I saw a really funny meme on LinkedIn the other day about uh, coaches and about how uh, there's now more coaches than there are business people in the coaching world suffering as a result or something like that. <laughs> and I'm not saying that's exactly what you do, but there seems to be a lot of people out there who are selling courses on, on X, Y, Z. But how, how do you make your story habit, for example, how do you make that stand out amongst uh, a, a lot of story related content out there? Well, that's actually a, a, um, a question that's been on the top of my mind for the last few months since I, right. I landed in the UK and have um, started in this new market. And I've realized there are a lot of competitors over here, a lot of other people doing storytelling, coaching and training and consulting. And mm. what I think, what I believe at the moment is it's the individual connection that you have with people. That's all that matters. Um, if they know you, they like what you do, they trust you, mm -hmm. um, and they have the capability to work with you, then they'll bring you in. And yep. last year, I spent a lot of money, <laughs> wasted actually, a lot of money um, on doing all of the blueprint marketing stuff. I had yep. SEO, I had an SEO copywriter, I had someone doing um, keyword research for me on YouTube. I, I did everything you're supposed to do and none of it worked. And I realized that the one thing I had, um, I had abandoned was actually building those one-to-one -one connections with people. Yeah. And once I started doing that, that is when I started getting leads. So before I tried to automate like um, cold outreach on LinkedIn and I had scripted messages and they'd be pinging out and people be getting pissed off because no one likes getting those because everyone gets yeah. those. And then I would just one-on-one -on -one, um, manually reach out to people and attempt to start a conversation with people. And then once they responded, I wouldn't follow up with a scripted re reply. It would be yeah. a natural conversation. And once I started doing that, that's when things started to work out. And, you know, just on the coaching thing. So, I think it, a, a practical way of thinking about it for any coaches listening to this is that um, if you, let's say, for example, you, you are a client and I am a coach. And um, in that case, my only competitors are the only coaches you know and trust and would buy from. Yeah. And for most people, I, I imagine they don't have many coaches they know and trust and would buy from. Um, yep. some people do but that kind of really narrows it down at, at the same time I do also think the coaching market is quite oversaturated um, but if you have something of value to offer then you know what market isn't oversaturated no, I, I think agree. a lot of markets are saturated these days yeah no, I agree I agree tell me about something you struggle with or find tough something I struggle with I, I think it was related to that question you just asked, actually. Like the last few months since I got here, 
Yeah. Um, because I'm I'm fresh off the boat. I've been away from the UK for 16 years. I was in China. For anyone not listening, I feel like we should probably pull at that thread as well. Like, tell yeah. tell me a bit about because obviously, yeah, Yuri. I think he introduced us, or he, he certainly was the path how we sort of came together. But he mm. was also in China for a, a long time, and he went. I think he went straight from university. In fact, I, he may have even done his final year there, if I recall correctly. Like, yeah. How, how how did how did that go come about? Because that's that's a big step for someone. You mean moving from China back here? No, moving to China in the first place. Oh, that was because I was twenty one and um I I broke up with my girlfriend and I was working in a coffee shop and I thought, Oh fuck this and I just decided <laughs> I just decided to go and teach English in a foreign country. I submitted my C V and three weeks later I was there. It was very, very um compulsive. Uh, a very wow, spur of the it moment. Was that decision. quick? A, that quick a process? Yeah, I had nothing else going for me at the time. Um, I'm very glad I went though. Um, there were lots of challenges over those 16 years, but uh, I I learned a lot. Um, so, and, and you know, I mean, I'm in a similar boat right now because I spent 16 years there. I established mm. myself there. Um, my business network was there. My business was there. But I decided to leave because I felt uh, lots of reasons. You know, my kids needed to go to school and I wanted them going to school here. Also, yep. I felt that I was kind of plateauing in my growth and I was just working with Chinese people. And Chinese people are lovely, but I want to work with a broader audience as well. And um, I just needed to challenge myself and go somewhere a bit more internationally connected. And so that's right. where, you know, uh, so three months ago, I moved back here. So going back to your original question of, you know, what, what, what is a challenge for me or what, what kind of concerns me? Um, being back here for these last few months, I, I've been thinking, wow, there's a lot of people doing storytelling training. And wow, there's a lot of people in the leadership development industry. Wow, there's a lot of coaches. There's a lot yeah. of competition over here. Um, and that's quite intimidating. Um, but does it also show that there's a demand for the, the stuff though? I, I guess so. Um, yeah. I mean, there is, there is a demand and I, I do a lot of, I do a lot of work with partner companies and they've kept me very, very busy since I've been here. So training right. for their clients. So there's definitely a big demand, um, in, in different areas of the markets. And I would say, especially in leadership development for big corporates, I think there's always going to be a big demand. Um, but I, recently I've had to kind of overcome that, um, uh, those concerns by just telling myself that, you know, what market isn't saturated. <laughs> uh, yeah. So many markets are saturated and I have an ecosystem of products that are validated um, that customers have liked and that were starting to generate leads for me before, before I kind of paused everything for the move. So, right. um, yeah, uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Had you preempted the move as in, were you starting to try and do stuff from China with, with the yeah. of being here? Yeah. Um, I, I was doing a lot of networking on LinkedIn. I was doing a lot of testing online as well. So I shared earlier that I wasted a lot of money on marketing last year and yeah. I knew at least most of that money would be wasted, but I wanted to just try everything just to mm -hmm. see what works, what doesn't work. And, you know, I hated the idea of doing scripted cold outreach messages, but so many people keep talking about them. So maybe I'm wrong. I'll give it a go. Okay, it didn't work, but at least now I know. It's funny, it's what... funny you say that. We, <laughs> I was having this conversation with someone the other day about these spammy messages on LinkedIn. Mm. And I was like, I don't understand why people do it. And, and their argument was, well, it must be working for somebody. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise the services wouldn't exist, the, you know, and the people wouldn't keep doing mm. it. And I don't know if that's just a case of, I don't know, excellent salespeople who are pushing this stuff. I, I think it's... Like, for example, LinkedIn trainers. I think LinkedIn is a bit like, um, it's a bit like a nightclub. And a LinkedIn trainer is a bit like, um, a, a, a bit like someone standing outside the nightclub, uh, handing out flyers for ladies night. 
And then all of the users of LinkedIn are all of these guys desperate for ladies. And so they pick yeah. up the flyer and they go to the ladies night and there's no ladies. There's just other guys looking for ladies there. <laughs> and I notice on LinkedIn <laughs> that um, our clients don't really use it. They're too busy. <laughs> the yeah. only people using it and the only people commenting on each other's posts are, are people looking for clients like, like us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, so I, I, I've, I don't know if, you know, I don't think I'd completely give up on LinkedIn. I think there is still some potential. I've generated some leads on LinkedIn. But I think the biggest purpose of LinkedIn is meeting, you know, like this, meeting yeah. new people. Um, and that can lead to all sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, that, that, and I, I think that's, that's why that lead generation stuff exists. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very funny, but also quite realistic analogy you've just said about LinkedIn. I, I said the same thing. Like, I, I, I hate having to play this game. And I feel like if the, all the people I'm talking to are just other people looking for the same business opportunities I'm looking for. And and the way they get round at these LinkedIn gurus is they will say something along the lines of, well, you know, 99% of people are lurkers on LinkedIn. They don't even like comment or produce content. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So they're, they're reading it. It's like, it's just a bit BS, isn't it? It's just, it is. And I think, oh. I think desperation, desperation buys. There are a lot of people who are desperate, and I felt this as well. Like I, I've been or, fo or FOMO, right? Yeah, and and, yeah. and I, I think the desperation creates that FOMO. But I, I yeah, felt maybe. this in my own business as well. Like I've got to get customers. I really want to get customers. How do I get customers? I need to get a customer, and and you're desperate, and so and then someone sells you the solution pay yeah. this money, get customers. Okay, I'll do that. But I think the most successful people I know, um, they're not in that desperation mindset. They are yeah. they're in it for the long game. Uh, and they know that you have to build trust, you have to build relationships with people. And that takes a lot of time. Um, and it's not mm. going to come out by following some blueprint formula. Um, <laughs> you've got to invest energy in being genuine and actually getting to know people sorry <laughs> no it's true it man it's true i think it's it's a snake oil salesman isn't it and, and i feel that's a bit harsh on some of these linkedin gurus because there, there is yeah. a lot of value they do share but ultimately they're preying on the fact that they know you want to grow your audience and it's like well you know follow this do this pay me and blah blah yeah yeah but, i i think there are some linkedin trainers who are probably quite helpful and they will at least tell you how to get the most out of LinkedIn. But I, yeah, yeah I, the more people I speak to, um, the more I learn that most people aren't generating, I'd say most people aren't generating leads on LinkedIn from the people I've spoken to. Of it's those the gold who, rush, isn't it? They're, they're, they're yeah. selling, the, selling the spades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. Um, and, and yeah. of the people I know who do generate, well, who, who are doing very well in terms of their business, most of their leads won't come through LinkedIn. Maybe a few will, but very few. Yeah. It's not really a place for, for finding customers. Um, yeah. So are we, are we not going to see the Jamie Dixon LinkedIn storytelling course anytime soon? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> no. Um, I, I, I may still experiment with uh, with LinkedIn for finding customers. I hold out hope that I'm wrong, but so far my experience has told me it's uh, yeah. Uh, okay uh, then. So basis. for anyone who's listening, thinking, "Oh, that's really great information, Jamie. Thank you." But where do I find my customers? <laughs> What's the answer? I think just meeting people. I I I, I think just meeting people. The um, you know, the the people I know, and and if I think back in my own experience as well, when I was in China. Because I'm fresh off the boat here, uh, so I don't have I don't have much business here. But in uh, in China, the people I know who are successful over here as well, a lot of it comes from word of mouth uh, and referrals. Yeah. I'd say most of their business comes from that. And how do you get to that stage? Patience and doing a good job, <laughs> I think. Mm. Um, and and so for me in my situation, like being fresh off the boat and new to it, my focus now is just. Um, go out and meet people, um, reach out to people. Um, I'm still going to post things on LinkedIn because I find it helpful to, you know, articulate my thoughts and 
I also think yeah. running webinars on LinkedIn, so long as they're not a sleazy upsell thing, I think that can be quite useful, at least to raise awareness of what I do. But other than that, I'm also going to go out and meet people and hopefully speak at some events um, and just be patient. <laughs> I think that's all I can do. Yeah. Okay. Who, if you could shadow someone, I'll leave it open. It was going to be an author. If you could shadow one author for the day, who would it be and why? But I'm going to open it up a bit wider if you wanted it to be. If you could shadow one person for the day, who would it be and why? Uh, that's a good question. Because I, I don't know if I've seen someone who does exactly what I want to do. There are more, like there's a number of things I want to do. Uh, and yeah. probably different people for different um, different categories of those things. Okay. Um, our friend Yuri, I'd love to shadow him one day when he's doing his consulting, because uh, he he really he's very unique and uh, he's yeah he knows what he's talking about. He knows how to how to do. Oh, you should definitely end. ask him. I'm sure he'd have no problem yeah. letting you do that. Yeah, maybe one day I'm um, if I'm in the Netherlands where he is right now. Um, uh, yeah, I'd love to see how he works in real life. There's a few, um, there's a few people on Udemy. So for example, there's a guy called Graham Nichols, who I don't really know him. I've taken one or two of his courses, but he has a whole bunch of courses on Udemy and I'm sure right. he's raking it in <laughs> just looking at his sales figures. I'm sure he's making a decent amount of money. Um, what, what, what are his courses about? about? His, a lot of his courses are about NLP, about coaching, about building a coaching okay. business. But he's built a massive community online, and he's obviously providing a lot of value to his to his followers. And he's really invested that time in being authentic. Um, and so it'd be quite interesting in seeing how he how he does that. I think for an author, I really like Will Store. Um, Okay. Will Store, he wrote a book called The Science, the of, Science Storytelling. of Storytelling. Yeah, yeah, which was uh, it was quite a big inspiration for the story habit as well. And he's written a few other really interesting books. And I just love how he finds great stories and um and just con deconstructs them and picks apart the theory yeah. behind them. I really love that style. So I'd love to see how he does his his research. He's done. Yeah. He's done some good podcasts. I've I've heard him on a few podcasts actually. Mm. They, they, I don't think they're really doing it anymore. The Creative Rebels used to. I used to love that podcast. I don't know what happened to those guys, but he was on there a few years ago, and he. I I went and bought his book instantly straight after listening to the podcast. I was like, this guy is really good. So mm. I can I can see why you would think that. Yeah, yeah. I I I found. Yeah, just the way he does his research, I'd love to see what he's doing in the background because it's fascinating. Uh, have you have you reached out to him? Have you connected with him anywhere? I I have not. I have not. Maybe maybe I will one day because I I am yeah, um, Jamie. Do it. I I mentioned him a few times in my book because his his book really helped to deconstruct the science of storytelling. Very very. Send useful. him a copy. Have you not sent him a copy? <laughs> I I I have not. I have not. I'm. Maybe Come I should. On, you can do that. What's what's the worst that's gonna happen? It's gonna cost you whatever the whatever you get the books for. Do it. Send him one. Yeah. I thought I thought you'd I thought you'd appreciate it. You were in it. You know, yeah. Yeah. I could try that. Yeah. Do it, do it, do it. Okay, next question. If someone came up to you and they said they wanted to write a book, what would you tell them? I would ask them why they want to write a book. And if they uh if they said they wanted to um Make lots rich and of money. Yeah, <laughs> I, I tell them, <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Go on Udemy. If you want to make a passive income, go on Udemy. Um, uh, but yeah, if you're going to write a book, uh, yeah, I would ask them, why are you writing the book? And I've had, um, I've had a few discussions with friends who are in the process of writing a book or are thinking about writing a book. Uh, one interesting thing that's come out from those discussions is the value of just getting your first book done. Um, okay. even if it's, it's not going to be the book you base your business on. Um, but there's so many barriers to finishing writing a book. It's very easy to sit down and start writing stuff. It's very difficult to then form a logical structure and then decide which ideas stay, which ideas go. 
and it's even more difficult to get to the launch phase and then it's even more difficult to market the book there are so many barriers to overcome in the process of writing a book so yeah i i for the first book just write a bloody book don't worry about it I, just write one <laughs> get it done just to, just to devil's advocate a little bit so you said there's lots of challenges to write a book uh barriers to writing a book i think was the phrase you used hmm. has that changed recently and i and i don't know this because i'm not but like with the sort of the the route of self-publishing so whereas it used to be like you had to find a book editor and then you had to get signed by penguin or whoever it was like and I guess there's 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 pros and cons of whichever route one goes down. But to actually go from being a, a non-published to a published writer, theoretically, is it a lot easier to do today than it ever has been before? Theoretically, yeah. Um, but from the people I know, the reality is um, perfectionism is the biggest barrier. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'd say that really is the biggest barrier. Um, okay because a lot of people they just like i know some people who have got to a stage where they've written a goddamn book but they're like i just want to tweak this bit and i just want to tweak this bit and i just want to tweak this bit and they've been doing that for two years um and how, how do they get past that then i think you just have to accept that it's not up to you to define what a good book is it's up to your audience and yeah. if your audience are telling you oh, it was a good book i liked it then um that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what yeah. you think. Um, and also opening yourself up to the reality that people are, well, not everyone is going to like your work. Um, and that, that can be quite painful. <laughs> um, you know, so do you think that, do you think that fear is, is part of what the masquerading is perfectionism? I think so. Um, yeah, I, I think so. And I, I think as well, having particular standards which you think are worth holding on to because it's about you and your identity um yeah. but if that's holding you back from actually doing anything then well maybe that's <laughs> maybe it's not a part of you you want to keep <laughs> um so no. yeah yeah I, I from the I people i know oh yeah that's true of all content creation not just writing i think yeah you're not always going to get it right and i think you have to just get stuff out there, get feedback, refine it. Um, and then yep. sometimes I put stuff out there and I've got some negative feedback from people. And I'm like, I'm okay with that because they just didn't get it. <laughs> uh, yeah. or, um, or, you know, I know not everyone was supposed to know that uh, was supposed to like that. Um, so, okay. Um, it's just the reality. Where, where's the line though? Where's the line of, of get? <laughs> And just for the record, I do agree with you. I, I've had this conversation with numerous times. But where's the line about getting something out there that's not perfect, but then is also potentially substandard? Mm. I.e. you don't want to damage yourself reputationally. You go, oh, this Jamie Dixon, what he doesn't know what bloody he's talking about. Yeah. Like where where's that sort of grey area come in? I think it's validation. Um Okay. Like and I described my research process earlier, a lot of it is testing stuff in workshops, testing it with clients, making sure it sticks, making sure they like it, making sure they, they'd actually book people to come in and sit in on this workshop. Um, right. That to me is validation that, well, and then also not having them complain at the end of the workshop. Um, that to me Asking is validation. Asking for a refund. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty terrible. That would be a big yeah. sign that, okay, I think I need to change something here. But once, once you've got validation from, you know, your target audience, then why, why go and make it even better and never publish it? You could be, you could be benefiting from it and so could they. Um, yeah. So if they validate it, release it. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Last question for you. If we mm. spoke again in 12 months and you said to me, Chris, you know what? It's been a really good year for me what would have happened i think um my story habit coaching and training and workshops would be generating a sustainable amount of leads um i'd be getting lots of good feedback from clients and um i would have a few new digital products uh, a few maybe i don't know i have to be really
realistic about time. I've got kids, but two or three <laughs> new online courses or books that I can add to the ecosystem. And new opportunities have evolved out of all of this. Um, so, yeah, that, that would be success to me. Yeah. I, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to totally cheat and ask you one last question that's just come to me. So you mentioned Will Store earlier. Mm. And I guess my question is around how you compare yourself to him or mm. compare the story habit to his book, The Science of Storytelling. And his, and I, I guess where I'm going with this is a lot of people who talk about storytelling will reference him and his book, right? Mm. It's, 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 it's very well regarded and it's, in the, on the subject is one that a lot of people will go to. How do how far away do you think your book is from being in that same category of the science of storytelling? I don't think it is in the same category um, because his book is extremely well researched um, and about the science of of it, whereas yeah. mine is a bit more about how to actually do it. So, okay, I, well, let me interrupt you then because yeah. I would argue then that actually yours is probably more important then. Because um, to a certain point, I don't really care about the science, I just want the, the results. Mm. I guess what I'm trying to get at is how do you go from being a, a writer about storytelling? Like, and I don't know if this is me sort of like Will Store seems to be quite famous in this niche. Like how do we how do we get to the point where Jamie Dixon is equally as famous as Will Store is probably a better way of asking the question. I think I would have to keep working on on that audience building. I think right. someone like Will Store, they're a journalist. I think they're probably well connected, although I wouldn't say that's why they're successful. He's also a very, very good author. He's very good at what he does. He's very good yeah. at making the science accessible. Um, and, he, and he has a very specific niche of making psycholo psychological science accessible and interesting. Right. That seems to be his niche. Um, so he's very good at that. Plus, he's a famous journalist who I assume is well-connected. Um, so for me to get to a level like that, I think I would need to... I would need to work a lot more on the audience building and it would take me a yeah. very long time. And do, do you probably... think that's what it is? Or do you, do you think that the story habits will almost, or it's like, the, I guess it's the chicken and the egg, right? Some people who don't have that audience to begin with might have the book, but actually might pick up a bit of momentum and then get a bit more fame and a bit more awareness. And then actually then the audience becomes as a result of that book, getting more, more popular. Mm. What do you mean, sir? Well, so say, so say you're starting with a point of not a very big audience, but you've got a book mm. and then one person goes, Oh, this book, I read this book by James Dixon yesterday is really, really good. You might find it interesting. And then they share it with one person. And then the book almost becomes the, the tool that helps you then build that audience. Whereas mm. Will Store as an example, may have come from it of actually having that audience in the first place because he's a successful. So he, then he drops the book into his into his ecosystem and it, it just propels quicker because he's got that audience in the first place. Mm. But maybe maybe the story habit gets to the point where people start sharing it and, you know, you come on podcasts like this and a few people, extra people get it and then that becomes the thing that actually grows your audience. Mm. Uh, that's and a very to that level of, of knowledge where will not knowledge of awareness that will store has yeah no, that's a very good question and it's a question that makes me think as well and the thought that comes to my mind right now is to make those shorter really practical how-to guides yeah. um i think the story habit tries to be a blend of the how-to and the why it works and how it works um, and maybe tries to be a bit too many of those things uh, right. to be a book that gets talked about um, a lot like that. But if it's focused on one particular thing, which I think is what Will Storr does, he focuses on, yeah. here's the science, um, and I'm going to make it interesting. Um, and my strength is definitely not on the science side of things, but on the how to get results side of things. And right. so I think going forward, if I take all of the ideas that I've got from the story habit and the tools 
and I just break them down into a series of very simple books, short, very accessible, very practical, and I test them out with people and make sure people are getting the results they're intended for through these books and yep. um, make any refinements I need to make them shorter, 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 and then publish them. Um, then I think if I follow that kind of process, uh, I, I think that is a way to build a good reputation um, and, a, and a book that gets passed around by word of mouth. So yeah, yeah. I appreciate that question because that's a, that's a good question to think on. I think that would be the way to, to go about it. At least that's what I can think of right now. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Jamie, I want to wish you uh, a very warm thank you for coming on and sharing your thoughts with me and the Tenky Interview audience this morning. Thank you for having me. If anyone me. wants to come and say hi and check out your work, where's the best place for me to link to in the show notes to send them to? Um, just go to LinkedIn um, or thestoryhabit.com. Um, if you go to LinkedIn, okay. you can search Jamie Dixon. You'll find my head on an orange background. Um, or you can go to thestoryhabit.com and you'll find everything there as well. I will link to both and then everything else we've discussed below in the show notes. But Jamie, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it, Chris. And it's nice to meet you as well. Indeed, man.